free. Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. Hope your night or day is going good and everything's going well with you. In my videos, I'm constantly trying to revise my explanation to give a very clear and precise representation of the gospel that all we have to do to have eternal life is believe on the Son. He that believes on the Son of God hath the life. He that does not believe on the Son of God does not have the life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's that simple. The gospel is a very simple message. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. Put your faith in the Savior and he'll save you. But we're not called to put faith in ourselves or our future performance or our works. And yet many people will add in that you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved, that you can't just simply believe you also have to repent of your sins. We can see very clearly from the scripture that if we had to repent of our sins, we would have to do works. We see in Jonah chapter 3 verse 10, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So the scripture says, then God saw their works and they turned from their evil way. So when people turn from their evil way, when they repent of their sin, they're doing works. Then God saw their works and they turned from their evil way. This was a situation where God had told Jonah to go preach to the city of Nineveh because he was going to bring a disaster upon the city. But if they turned from their evil way, God would relent from the disaster that he was going to bring upon the city. And the Bible says that God saw their works and that they turned from their evil way. So when a person repents of their sin or they turn from their evil way, they are doing works. Now, when people say you can't just simply believe and be justified before God, they're saying you have to also repent of your sins. They're saying you have to do works. They're, they're by implication saying you have to do works of the law. Since sin is transgression of the law and turning from our evil way is works, what they're saying is you can't simply believe, you also have to do works. Now the scripture shows us, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. That when it comes to the law and repenting of sin, no one will get a non-guilty verdict by repenting of their sin. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. So the person who says you have to repent of your sins, you can't simply believe. They're also saying that you have to do works, that you have to do works in order to get justified and be made righteous and to get favor before God. But the scripture says to the one who works, it's not counted as favor, but his wages do. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So we can see in the scripture, according to the gospel, it's not to the one who works that gets favor. They get wages due. The one who's not simply believing, but also bringing their works into the framework of salvation and saying that you have to do works. You can't simply believe, but you also have to do works. That is, you have to repent of your sin. To the one who works, it's not counted as favor, but as wages do. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. Notice, the only thing you have to do is believe. To the one who doesn't work, so you don't have to work, you don't have to repent of your sins. We can see that would be works. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. So if you were to turn from your evil way, if you had to turn from your evil way to be justified and be made righteous, that would be works. But it says to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So you don't have to work, you don't have to repent of your sins. But believe on him, Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, that's a non-guilty verdict. His faith is accredited to righteousness. So we can see from these scriptures, the one who has a theology that you have to repent of your sins, you have to bring your works into the picture. For them, it's not counted as favor, but as wages do. Now they owe something under the law. And the reason why that is, is the scripture says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do all things in the book of the law to perform them. That all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. All who rely on repenting of their sins are under a curse. For cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do all things in the book of the law to perform them. The scripture is telling us that when it comes to keeping the law, you can't just do the best you can. You have to do it perfectly, completely, without fail, and no room for error. You have to do everything and all things in the book of law to perform them. And if you don't get an A-plus or 100% score, 
and you break one infraction, then you're guilty of the entire law. James chapter 2 says whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all of it. So according to the scripture and the gospel, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. All who rely on repenting of their sins are under a curse. Because they have to repent of 100% of their sins and they can't ever sin again. If they ever sin again, then they're guilty of the entirety of the law. The scripture shows us that we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That a person is justified by faith apart from repenting of sin, since sin would be transgression of the law. A man is justified apart from turning from their evil way, since turning from your evil way would be works. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. So when it comes to being justified or made righteous in the sight of God, it's not a matter of repenting of sins. It's a matter of putting your faith in Jesus Christ. If you add in repenting of sins as a condition by which then one is justified and made righteous, then you place yourself under the curse of the law and its expectation and obligation to keep it 100% without error. And the scripture says the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That the law brings about the wrath of God. Because if you're under the law, you'll be judged by the law. The scripture says all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. So the law brings about the wrath of God. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. And that's for those who put their faith in Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 verse 4 that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That when we put our faith in Christ and we believe in him as a perfect savior, the law comes to its end. And according to scripture, we then get a righteousness not of our own through the law. May I be found in him having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the law comes to its end. Then we get a righteousness not of our own through the law. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. God gives us his righteousness, Romans chapter 3, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. So we see that we're not made righteous because of any works that we have to do. It's not anything that we have to do in terms of works to be saved. We just put our faith in Christ and he saves us on the basis of his mercy. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy, he saved us. When it's saying not because of works of righteousness that we have done, it's saying that it's not because we have repented of our sin and have kept the law that he saved us. Remember Jonah chapter 3, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So when it comes to us being saved, it's not on the basis of our works. Not because of works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy, he saved us. We see the same language in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The verse could easily say this. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of repenting of sins, lest any man should boast. Since according to scripture, turning from your evil way would be works, we're not saved by our works. We're not saved of ourselves, it's by grace that we have been saved, through faith not of ourself, but as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll probably notice that I'm bringing out a lot of verses that have to do with works as we examine this Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 verse. Because as we rightly divide the word of truth, we'll begin to see a clearer picture of what it means to be saved, what it means to put your faith in Christ independent from any works, and that would include independent from any repenting of sin. Some people teach that after you believe, then you become holy on the basis of your works. And this doctrine is called progressive sanctification, that you become progressively holy by your works. But the scripture says he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So he saved us and called us with a holy calling. So he already saved us. Just like we see in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, by grace you have been saved. So we've already been saved. He saved us and he called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works. 
So we're not made holy because of our own works. We're not made holy because we turn from our evil way. We're not made holy because we repented of our sin. We're made holy because of purposes of grace. And these purposes of grace have to do with the work of the cross that he reconciled us to himself, that Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So we're made holy through purposes of grace through the cross and not on the basis of our own works. If you think about the people in Matthew chapter 7 who say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? What they're ultimately saying is, Lord, Lord, haven't we turned from our evil way? Haven't we repented of our sin? Haven't we kept the measure of the law? Yet you see Jesus tell these people, depart from me, you who practice iniquity, I never knew you. So we see very clearly that the law brings about the wrath of God. The law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. The one who's appealing to their wonderful works, their repenting of sins, their law compliance, and not to just faith alone in Christ are the ones who are going to hear, depart from me, you who practice iniquity. That's why if you want to get out from the wrath of God and out from under the law, you have to come and put your faith in Christ alone so that there's no more law, so there's no more transgression. The Bible says the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ, but once you've been justified by faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. Once you've been justified by faith, which is a non-guilty verdict, you're no longer under the law, which means there's no more transgression. The law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Acts chapter 13 verse 39 says, Through him everyone who believes is freed from all things to which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. So the one who believes is freed from the law of Moses. The one who has faith in Christ alone is freed from the law of Moses. So that where there is no law, there is no transgression. But notice all these verses have to do with only the ones who believe. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The law was a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ, but once you've been justified by faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. Through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things through which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. So the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression, and that's for those who believe. The law has come to its end, they've been freed from the law, and they're no longer under the law. That's one of the reasons why we know it's not on the basis of our repenting of our sins or our works, because once you believe the law comes to its end, you've been freed from the law and you're not under the law. If once we believed we had to start repenting of our sins, then the Bible wouldn't use language like the law has come to its end, we've been freed from the law and we're not under the law. Romans chapter 7 says, Brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to another, that is, him has been raised from the dead. So we can see from this scripture, we have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, some of the strongest terms possible. So where there is no law, there is no transgression. We have died to the law, we've been freed from the law, we're not under the law, and the law has come to its end. So it can't be the case that when you come to Christ and put your faith in him, that now it's dependent upon your repenting of sins to ultimately be made right and justified and to be saved. The people that say that are merely trusting in their works, they're trusting in their performance. And they're demonstrating that they actually don't believe because those who believe Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The one who truly believes doesn't look to the law, they look to Christ where God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That our righteousness is in Jesus Christ that's not found in self. And it's not found in performance to the law. And those who say that it is, that you have to repent of your sins to have some right standing before God, nullify the grace of God. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If our right standing with God came through our repenting of sins, and to the law, then Christ died needlessly. But we know that he didn't die needlessly. According to scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, by his will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So we've been made holy once and for all. It was through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it wasn't on the basis of our works. It was on the basis of purposes of grace. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. 
So we're not made holy because of our own works, but because of the cross. By his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. And so this is why Paul would say, may I never boast except in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. But there's only one singular means for boasting to be made holy before God. And there's no secondary avenue. May I never boast except in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul's been crucified to any other attempts in the world to be made holy. There's only one singular avenue that God has provided, and that's the cross. By his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So our boasting to be made holy is not the repenting of sins or our works, but it's the cross and the cross only. So the people who say you have to repent of your sins to be made right and justified in the sight of God to be made holy are merely boasting in the flesh before God. And doing so, denying the only avenue by which God has provided, by which we are made right and perfect and holy in his sight. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. So by one single offering, what Jesus did on the cross, he has perfected us forever in the sight of God. Those who appeal to their performance, their repenting of sins, are merely boasting in the flesh and denying the only avenue by which we are made holy and perfect in the sight of God. Because when they add repentance of sins as a condition to be saved, then they're ultimately saying, it's my works that are ultimately saving me. When they say believing in Christ alone isn't enough to save, they're saying Christ is an insufficient savior, so you have to bring your works. And what they're demonstrating is they actually don't believe in Jesus as savior, but they believe that they themselves are their own savior. And they look to Jesus as more of a motivational guide to get them there. When people say you can't simply believe, what they're saying by implication is there's something else. And the implication of that is there's something else that saves. That you can't simply believe in Jesus, he's not going to save you alone. The implication is there's something else. There's something else that you need to bring to the table. And whatever that something else is, is the something that's getting them to not trust in Christ completely and totally. When someone says you can't simply believe, there's something in their mind or in their heart or in their life that's in the way, something else that they're trusting in that's keeping them from trusting in Christ. And what it usually is, is their sin. They think their sin is in the way and they have to remove it in order to be made right with God. And that's a denial of the Savior. The scripture says the Son of God has appeared to take away our sin and in him there is no sin. The purpose of the Son of God is appearing was to take away our sin. And so when a person doesn't believe that their sin has been taken away and that they have to repent of their sin, it's a sign that they haven't believed in the work of the Son of God because the Son of God has come to take away our sin and in him there is no sin. The moment someone says you have to repent of your sins to be saved, they're already confessing that they don't believe in the work of the Son of God because the Son of God has appeared to take away our sin and in him there is no sin. And the sin that he took away was past, present, and future sin by one offering. He has perfected forever those who are sanctified. So when someone says you can't simply believe in Jesus Christ to be saved, but you also have to repent of your sin, they have just offered forth a subconscious confession that they don't believe in the work of the Son of God. And now by proxy, they will have to believe in their own works. Because there's something else that saves, you can't just simply believe according to them. So I hope this video helps someone and blesses someone. Next time somebody says that you can't simply believe, but you also have to repent of your sins, realize that you're probably most likely dealing with an unbeliever, and this is a good springboard to go into the gospel and the functionality of the law. We can show them how we're saved by faith alone in Christ, independent from any law performance or any false self-perceived goodness that one thinks they have in themselves. So God bless you guys. Peace to you. Take care. And I hope your night or day is going good. Mm -hmm.